it's obvious that you put a tremendous amount of effort into this work. Yeah. Why did you do it, and are you an ex-cyclist? No. I've had multiple knee operations back in the, when, for arthroscopy, okay? So let's just say my knees ain't been working well for four decades, five decades. I was doing research in the use of the bicycle nail strain out back from 1890 to 1915. It was the most significant place in the world where the bike played a role. I won't go into detail here, but um, I knew what everything cost. I knew what shoes cost, socks cost, and what food cost. I knew what bicycles cost. And one day, I mean, over the period of time, I was, particularly this 1904 period, I kept running across references to this black American cyclist winning these races in Sydney. Now, I grew up in America. I'm dual nationalist half my life in each country. So I knew who Jesse Owens was. I knew who Jackie Robinson was. My first baseball team was the Cleveland Indians with Larry Doby, the first American League black player. And so I'd heard of these guys. And I remember sitting in the New South Wales Public Library one day, and I had this newspaper open. I, I remember Kai looking and I said, who the hell is Major Taylor? And just like that. So I started taking notes. And uh, I eventually, uh, this is the late 70s, and then I went back in the early 80s for an intense period, and I put it all aside. Um, then in 1987, uh, I had a, a friend, uh, Dino De Laurentiis, had opened a movie studio in Australia, the one they now do Mission Impossible and Warner Brothers and all this. And they toured around the country asking for film ideas. Uh, my friend went to this, I didn't, and she came back and she says, oh, that thing you, you've told me about this black American cyclist, that'd make a neat film. So I sat down and I wrote up a, a simple cover letter to the head of Dino De Laurentiis Studio. And I, what I did was I took six pages of paper, pre-computer era, I put two photographs on each page and typed the caption under it, okay, and photocopied it. And that was it. Uh, six page, double picture. And I sent it off to him. And I got a letter back from him. And the letter said basically, no, we couldn't make a film out of this because A, he's black, B, it's bicycling, and I can't remember what the third reason was. And basically no one would want the film. Now, my friend, she was driving along the Swan River foreshore, and I read this to her. She looked at her and she says, that's bullshit. <laughs> Just like that. So I went back, I called Andrew Swanson, the WA Film Council, I said, please give me the names of six film producers in Australia, which he did. I sat back down with my IBM Selectric, no computer, typed six more pages with their name at the top, identical letter, photocopied six more of these things, sent it off, and about nine days later had two phone calls on the same day. And one of them was a guy named Paul Barron. He was Canadian and uh, Australian, originally from Canada, so Barron Films. And he, as he explained it, he, he had come back from a trip to Canada and he had a file of mail and on the desk and all kinds of things, being a film producer. And he was on the phone talking and he was thumbing slowly down through the pile and he saw this and pulled it out and kept turning the pages and it interested him. And being Canadian, he'd appreciate perhaps the racial implications the way an Australian might not have. So he hung up that call and dialed me. And you know, at the time, Paul Barron and I jumped his back. He said, I'm very interested in this story you have here. Um, what do you want to do with it? And I said, oh, I'll see it made into a film. He said, no, what do you want to do? Do you want to direct it? Do you want to write the screenplay? Do you want to act in it? What? And I said, oh, I can't do any of those things. I just want to see a good film. And he said, you have just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> that was in 87. Um, so in September 87, well, actually during August, I wrote the book in 28 days flat. I had uh, all my notes, and I just laid them out on tables. Uh, September's winter in, in Perth, but it's a nice climate, so I just dictated, gave it to a lady who typed, and back and forth. And so I wrote the book and gave it to the film producers. And then I headed off to America, and I got in Sydney, and David Salomon, who I'd written a lot of articles for for Bicycle in Australia, he said, oh, there's some guy in America, I heard he's writing something about Major Taylor, and he called me last year asking if I knew anything about him, but I didn't. He said, I think it was Andrew Ritchie. And so, oh, so I got to America in November, um, and I looked up Andrew's publisher, and I called him, they gave me Andrew's number, and I called him, and it's, it's all in this book, so it's worth reading. Uh, anyway, I called Andrew and said, hi, I'm Jim Fitzpatrick, and I I heard you've done something Major Taylor, I've just written a book on him. And I mean, the line was dead. And, for, and he says, just today, I delivered my manuscript to the printer on Major Taylor. <laughs> and I just am just stunned. And both of us, an Englishman in America, an American in Australia, and independently sort of discovered and written books. Now, what's interesting, Andrew Ritchie's book sweeps across his career, but there's only five and a half pages on the Australian tour. And, and it's no criticism of Andrew. The reason is very simple, and this is pre-internet era, and the only way you're going to get that info is to go down there and get it. Now, Taylor brought back a lot of clippings, and Andrew had access to these. But as Andrew said a few weeks ago, after he read my finished book again, he said, you've really explained this in a way I couldn't make sense of from the clippings Taylor had. 
And the clippings Taylor brought back were mostly from the Daily Telegraph, which was the publicity thing for the Sydney Summer Nights Amusement Committee. I went through, of course, the Australian Workers' Union magazines, the Bulletin. I went through every newspaper in the majors, literally every newspaper during that period. So I, you could only find out what happened by going through all of that material in Taylor's. So what you have with Ritchie's book sweeps his life beautifully, but that little section on Australia, which is missing, this 200 plugs right in. Had a publisher got us in a room and said, Andrew, you write the lot and let Jim do Australia, it would come out, I wouldn't think any differently. Just totally coincidental, so that's, that's the story of that. And the film went on, they made the film, it premiered on, Disney was a silent financier of the film. Um, they had say-so over the American actors and actresses, and they had a final veto on the dialogue in America, but certain phrases in Australia which aren't considered racist, like fuzzy wuzzy, up here they changed that, things like that. Australian uh, producer had say-so over the Australian actors and actresses, and of course they wrote the screenplay. Um, it's, I think he did a pretty good job of getting the essence of what went on, but you know, things are all around for the film. Unfortunately, it premiered on the Disney Channel in 92, Black History Month in 92, and then it uh, had a four-hour miniseries version on the ABC in June of 92 before the Olympics. Then it premiered in Australia in July. It went on the next year to win the Australian Logie, which is their Emmy for the most popular telemovie or miniseries in Australia. So it got quite a reception. But the film has never been available for rental or sale in America. Mm. I have no idea why. That's, mm. that's all out of my hands. That's, once bad. you turn over a property to a film company, that's it. So I don't know why that's the case. So, but that's the basic story behind the book. So the book's been around since uh, basically September 87. Thank you.